Welcome everybody right. back to Vale of Sound. Um, interview Sunday, and as usual, we always love to have interesting people here on the show, and I think today we have another one of those. Evan Patterson from J. Gile. Um, I don't even know if I pronounce it correctly, but anyway, so Evan, thanks for being on the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's J. Gile also. J. Gile? Oh yeah, of course, because it's the, the bird that is imprisoned, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. First question that I always ask, if you do, what kind of band mer merch are you wearing today? If anything. At band all. merch. I'm wearing no band merch at this moment in time. Yeah. So before anybody asks, I always also, of course, promote some people that I like. Ash and Spire from Scotland, one of my favorite bands from last year, one of the best black metal album from last year. And I would even go as far as the Imperial Triumphant album that Imperial, Imperial Triumphant didn't make. Um, but Evan, let's get back to you. Where are we catching you right now? Um, right now, I'm in the, on the porch of my home in Louisville, Kentucky. Isn't that the place where Cassius Clay was born? Uh, he was born here. That's correct. Cool. Muhammad Ali is a big figure in the world, but especially in Louisville. I mean, it's, you know, I think his, uh, his work beyond boxing was, you know, so valuable to this city and, and helping with segregation and everything else that's gone on. That is still very very prevalent in this city but it's i can't imagine it being it's much better than i'm sure with his work mm -hmm. so um as you've already mentioned you you live in louisville kentucky a state which i had the pleasure of being there once um and i i never got a real grip on the state is it a northern state is it a southern state when I hear people talk, I always feel like, okay, that's the South. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's considered the gateway of the South. That's what we call it. You know I mean? But also, I, I feel like Indiana feels very Southern, and, and it's north of us. So it's just... But, you know, anyone who's been to the States or anyone who lives in the States knows that there's Southern accents everywhere. You know, not just in all parts of rural areas of all states. It's That's true. most people have Southern accents. Maybe we should call them rural accents, but let's, let's stick to the South. <laughs> so you live in the South, but how much has the South shaped you? I mean, quite a bit. I mean, it's, it's always been, you know, I was raised you know, going to a Methodist church and being a, a Christian kid. And, you know, sometimes I would say, uh, you know, I feel like I've done a lot for just a, a little redneck kid that grew up in with a cornfield as my backyard. And, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of times I feel surprised that I found any kind of underground subculture that I latched onto because where we were, there was not any subculture. There was, it was not, there wasn't a, a music scene in this, the town that I was raised in. And, you know, it was an hour north of us in Louisville, but where I was raised was a little town, Kentucky. So I feel very, um, I wouldn't say, I don't know if I feel connected to the South, but I, I am from the South and I'm, I'm from an area that, you know, is, is not, it's not the same as being from a bigger city in the States. It's not the same as being from Chicago or, you know, New York or LA or mm. Seattle. It's the, uh, the influence is something that it's, you kind of have to go out and find it yourself here. It's not all around you. Mm -hmm. There's, there's not a, there's not a, there's not, you know, sh shows every night of bands that, you know, have, have changed the world. It's, it's like, it's really a small, small underground arts community in Kentucky. So surviving and, and doing it is, has always been important to me to kind of keep doing it, keep at it, keep working. 
I also asked for question because we will come back to it when we talk a little bit more in detail about the new record. Don't let your love life get you down. Um, which, first of all, is a wonderfully programmatic title. Um, but <laughs> something that struck me before I even turned on the music was the cover. It is a very mm -hmm. unusual JJL cover. Um, it is black it is. in a way, yes, but it's very, very colorful at the same time. Um, how did that come about? Did you have somebody who did it for you or? Um, the, the album art was something, you know, I hadn't, after making all of the music for the album, I hadn't really, I didn't want to do a photo of me. I'd done that in the past and I didn't want to have it be as, uh, kind of somewhat, uh, come off a little more centered around me. I, I wanted to feel a little more hopeful and something a little more at about, you know, that, that image to me, Thomas Hooper made it. It's the two paintings that he made. And I, I really latched on to those paintings because he had, he posted them on Instagram actually. And, and I, you know, I said to him, like, I really love these and, you know, can I purchase them from you? Also, would you be interested in letting me use them as album art? And he was just really kind of, stunned and happy and you know just like of course let's do this i would love to do anything you want to do with the album art you know more than willing and he actually the hands that are holding the paintings and the cover art are, are his his son's hands so that's also really exciting to incorporate his son into the artwork and just those images in general they just had this kind of really bright forward motion and growth and like a pinnacle feeling of you know something something that's not just flat and not just that's a photo or that's you know it's there's more to explore in the imagery in my opinion than just looking at it once you know there's there's lots of study and look at in these paintings definitely and yeah. that's kind of the that's kind of the idea of i mean the album while there's a lot of you know darker subjects and you know maybe there's a lot of sadness there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of like ideas of of growth and of of saying you know like it's okay move forward you know it's you know it, it's not a a thing for me to just be i don't ever want to be in the places that i've kind of been in my past where i've kind of been you know and swallowed by depression and kind of hit places where I, you know, lost sight of what was making me happy or what else could make me happy or what could bring me joy or what to do next. And the past couple of years, I've been working towards more of a, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, a hundred percent like positive view on everything, but definitely uh a little less uh wallowing <laughs> um something that just struck me when you spoke about it um could you agree to me saying that it's a record that puts the hand out to everyone who's lying in order to show them how to get up again I mean, yeah, of course, it's, it is definitely a, kind of, it's okay, everyone is, is going through very similar things, and there are many, many other things in life that can bring you out of it, and can make you, you know, move towards finding happiness in other places, and, you know, it, it's, you know, I wouldn't say that I particularly thought about um, picking people up or, or being an uplifting album because it's not an uplifting album but I mean it's definitely a thing of the topic of love and a topic of relationships being good or bad and relationships failing or relationships you know 
it's it's just such a it's it's a hot topic amongst humans and and i kind of always think about that in a way of you know what if we just put less importance on our love lives and more importance on our own self and in bettering ourself and not putting weight on other people and losing the codependency of, of our of our relationships and you know taking care of ourselves a little bit more on every level you know and that's kind of what i'm getting at with the title it's it's not just it's not just saying don't let your love life get you down it's saying don't let really any of these things that are very typical to to make us get down you know it's it's pushing against the fairy tale of of life and it's like there's no exact way that the things in your life that you are doing could make you happier or less happy and it's all just kind of it's it's a gamble on what's gonna work and what's not gonna work and it's, it's a life lesson more or less you know mm. We're constantly learning what is going to make us happier what is going to you know put us in a place where we feel like living and like celebrating and like creating you know, just waking up and having a enjoying the day rather than waking up and feeling like you don't want to do anything there. You know, mm-hmm. the whole, you know, the whole the whole aspect of just kind of finding a way to get out of depression. I mean, it's it's been very important to me in the past few years. What is also very interesting about the record as well as the message and as well as the lyrics is the music itself. The music itself is unmistakably JJ. That is not a question. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, it to me sounds like a bigger version of what JJ was before. It's, it is a dark record in, in a lot of parts, but it's also got some kind of, grandezza, some kind of splendor, some kind of brilliant moments in it, um, especially mm-hmm. in the sound. Um, how important was that sound for you? How long did it take to develop this special well, it's, sound? This, this album, and the, the songs I've been working on, I mean, some of the songs I've been working on for seven years and just kind of you know, playing playing guitar by myself alone at home and and working on the little the little tiny, you know, transitions and little little movements that are existing in the songs and you know, and, and also I mean, most of this album was the songs were near completed with with the vocal ideas and the melodies and the, the lyrical subjects and and as it went on it just became to, obvious to me, especially after recording, before even mixing the album, what songs were going to make the record. Because there are also four other songs that we recorded at the same time that were a lot more aggressive and kind of more towards something more akin to what Young Widows does. And those those four songs to me, as much as I was like, well, these songs are fantastic and they're, they're kind of a little more angry. And they're a little more, you know, heavy, and they have a different feel than these songs. So it was making the call of making this album that had a mood rather than an album that just goes, you know, from from one mood into this other mood into this other mood. And it was it's really important to me that it, you know that an album keeps keeps you in a place and rather than like jerks you around and, and takes you in and out of of moods it's it's important to me that that there's a body of music that you can put on and know it's going to make you feel a certain way from the moment it starts to the moment it ends and that's always been a big thing with the jjl albums is is finding that through. so with these songs i didn't really understand quite how 
um, pretty the songs were until Ben mixed the songs. And then when I was getting mixes from him and just his production quality was, was something that I knew it was going to be fantastic from working with him on the prison album that I made on my phone because he took these songs that I made on my phone and turned them into these massive pieces of music that, you know, to me, I, I was in shock even getting those mixes back. So I knew something fantastic was going to happen, but what he really did with this album in particular is he made it just gorgeous and beautiful and uh, everything that was moderately melodic, he made it even more melodic and, and more captivating in, in a way that, you know, I mean, it, like I was saying earlier before we started the interview, the uh, the first song that I heard, Black Diamonds and Bad Apples, when I heard that first mix, it it brought me to tears in a way of just like just overwhelming the sounds and the lyrics and the things that he did to make it all come together so perfectly. It's it's really something special and unique. I feel so fortunate to be able to work with him on this music. Uh, for, for everybody who might not know who Ben Chisholm is, Ben is um, working a lot, for example, with artists like Chelsea Wu. And um, he has a very certain knack for, for sound. He has a very good hand for it. Uh, you mentioned that first song that you got from him, or back from him, Black Diamonds and Bad Apples. Um, that is one of the examples, and that is one of the reasons why I asked about the South. When listening to the beginning of that track, it is very, very stubborn. Um, and I'm pretty sure that was also, at least subconsciously, like intentional. If it is, if it is, um, yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, it's it's kind of been a thing, like my kind of connection with blues music, and. You know, I mean, I guess it happened some point in playing with Young Widows. There was a certain point where I really connected to a lot of the Mississippi and Delta Blues and a lot of the guitar playing in particular. And as that kind of went on, my interest in that, and the more I listened to it, the more I just kind of became obsessed with certain artists and that, you know, create those songs that just have these kind of winding guitar parts and you know like junior kimbrough and john lee hooker and you know skip james and you know these these artists to me are just the more i got into them the more i was just like i want to make music like that that gives me that same feeling musically but you know i don't i don't want to be I don't want to be a Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of blues player. I don't, you know, I don't want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, you don't want to have an achy, breaky <laughs> artist player. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, you know, so it's the the southern aspect of it. You know, is it's funny. A friend of mine even mentioned that it's like this song is man. Your accent, you kind of sing with an accent on this song. Yeah, yeah. And I never really, I never really put it together until he said that and i was like oh i guess i do but it's just kind of what the song called for uh -huh. you know and it's because it's a it is a part of my my roots is is the accent and the country accent and the you know the southern accent it's, it's a real thing you that's know, and, true when i now hear you it sounds less southern when i hear you talk yeah but on the album, it sounds like. Rrr, rrr. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a that's the thing that happens. Yeah, I think maybe uh, you know, and, and I do listen to a lot of like folk and blues music, and you know, my my kind of, I kind of became more interested in country music for not as much as I am now, but just kind of more oddball 
the interesting stuff, you know, like Lee Hazelwood stuff and mm-hmm. just 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 kind of the the more artistic side of country music and the less pop side. That that's always been my, my interest in that genre of music. That point where I kind of rockabilly turned into country. But I really like that mm-hmm. point, you know. Like, so would then Johnny Cash also be a reference point? Yeah, I mean, of of course, Johnny Cash has some songs, but he wasn't. I wouldn't say he was one of the artists I was really mm-hmm. obsessing about. You know, it, mm-hmm. even like you know, like the first the first Link Ray album was was a yeah. record that I I really liked, and there's there's a lot of you know I started collecting forty five seven shows, and that's kind of how this whole the JJL project started. As I was collecting these random 45s you know just digging for hours and pulling things out and listening to them and then you know finding these one songs that don't exist anywhere else but on this little tiny record and listening to them over and over again and you know taking taking notes from it of like this is what i want to do like something like mm-hmm. this it's like you know it's you know something like i think about bands like spaceman three and suicide and you know they're also taking from the same like blues genre, you know, this around the same influences of when it kind of crossed over into something that wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily blues music and it wasn't rock and roll and it wasn't country and it was just this impossible to describe sound that, you know, artists were making. And that's that's kind of where where I want to do. I'm like, I want to I want to make an impossible to scratch sound. That's what I really want to do. The more you talk about it, the more I have a feeling as if we are talking about a can we say psychedelic folk record? Because it's very <laughs> broad. It, it it sometimes also reminds me, of, for example, of spiritualized. Um, yeah. Or sparkle horse or something like that, you know. Um, and the way that you have been describing the things, it sounds or it seems as if you're looking for that core that speaks to our soul, and also in a way which is not relatable to any kind of genre. But yeah. what also struck me is that with a lot of the artists that you mentioned, a lot of them are known for playing an acoustic guitar or writing their stuff on an acoustic guitar. Did you also do that with "Don't Let Your Love Life Get You Down"? Yes, I mean every every single song is written on acoustic guitar. You know, I mean that's that's kind of also. I mean, I steered away from that a little bit with the, uh, of course, with the Prison album and the No Trail album. Also, was was kind of more written in the rehearsal space with the band and a lot of just kind of jamming and finding the fun these you know hypnotic riffs and and this but this this album is very much a guitar album that was written on you know it's actually an arch top it's an old 60s sears arch top that i play that uh that's what i wrote every single song that's on this album on so you have also mentioned that um this record um, in, in one of the promo texts that I've read, that this record is, in a way, stepping a little bit back from J. Jail being your very own solo project, but more, again, a little bit into the realm of a band project. Um, so how must, how must we imagine that? Because you said you wrote it all by yourself. How much did the other musicians involved contribute to the songs? Um, a lot. I mean, honestly, probably four or five of these songs were just worked on endlessly in between tours in 2017 to 2019. And, you know, we were working on these songs and some of them we played live and, and, you know, having the, the band there to work on the songs and try out different things and have little, you know, suggestions and 
you know, ways, you know, just the way that my bandmates choose to play their instruments lends itself to a sound. And yeah, with, with the band, um, I've been playing with Todd Cook, who's the bass player who's been on the band since House Cricks, and he did not start the project with me, but he and I were doing another band prior to this, and he's always been one of my favorite bass players. He played on the Four Carnation self-titled album, which is an all-time favorite of mine. And his his playing has always been kind of dub influenced which is a thing that i really like that he he has that style because it adds a whole different kind of rhythm and take to the songs or instead of it just being you know playing along with the notes or or whatever it might be he he creates the whole another rhythmic element with his bass playing style so that's always been something it's very exciting and and with neil Argerbright, who plays drums, he has kind of chosen to be more of a drum machine rather than a, a drummer that wants to do drum fills and have. You know, he he wants to be very very minimal to the point where it doesn't even really want to change because he doesn't want to change the mood. He doesn't want to change the the energy. Really, it's it's. It's actually sometimes working in those, you know, with those guidelines and those parameters, it's it's difficult to make the song go anywhere else besides just like stay in that, that box and that mood and that, you know, headspace because of the, the styles of the band. Um and I was thinking about it in a way that, you know, a lot of JJL songs and records have been have been your babies, have been like your project. But is it also mm -hmm. like taking the freedom of saying, okay, I've been there, and now let's do a band thing again? You know, it's like the jailed Jaybird. Hey, I, yeah. Is it, <laughs> is, it, is it you finding the freedom outside of the cage by still limiting? your 100% responsibility for everything? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, there's still, I'm still the main composer of the songs and, you know, I'm still kind of, you know, saying yes and no and this is, this is, this is how it should be and this is how it shouldn't be and, this is where it ends this is where it starts this is the you know this is the change all of those things you know i'm still very much arranging and and you know mostly it's it's kind of the you know the artistic support of my band mates that mm -hmm. really sets sets it apart from you know other projects i feel like just playing you know doing something on your own completely on your own and writing songs without any influence of bandmates of you know of your peers is can be rewarding but sharing that with them is much more rewarding to me mm. um you have been talking about a lot of the songs revolving around love sadness personal growth also the dark sides of all of those things. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to play some of these songs in front of an audience who loves to hear them and who love, who seemingly loves to listen to your sad sides or to your sad stories? How does that feel? That dichotomy. I mean, I guess you know. I guess it feels. I mean, of course, it feels good to to have other people celebrate these these songs and these concepts and lyrical concepts and stories that that bring me joy to create and mm -hmm. while they might have a a sad undertone and mm -hmm. they might you know they might not be you know they might not be 
songs that someone would say would make you happy, but they they do make me happy. They always do, and that's mm -hmm. but that's kind of the point is you know discussing these things and having these these ideas and concepts about you know with the first song on the album um, warm blood and honey you know it's it's a it's a song about suicide that wraps itself up at the end of saying you know there is actually you can change everything you can change yourself you can do everything differently and you can you can do everything in your life differently if you want to but, you know you have to make that decision and so mm. there's always these kind of there's, there's always these kind of little wrap ups in most of these songs and stories where it's like it might feel like it's just like oh it's it's awful and it's sad and it's awful and it's it doesn't get any better than, than I always kind of try to make it the very and be like it is okay and it is better and and that's I think that's kind of where the the joy comes in of saying like you know we all feel these ways at times and we all you know kind of need someone to say it. you can do whatever you need to do to make yourself feel better or mm. or you can find little you know cracks of light of lightness and in, in the darker situations and you know one songs dealing with you know the death of of a friend and then wrapping around and saying like but the person that accidentally killed your friend you don't want them to suffer also you know it's there's just there's a lot of like ways that I'm, I'm trying to to have these perspectives of it just not being where life just is always awful and life is always depressing and because mm. it can easily turn that way very very easily and especially you know, if you see it that on. way right yes exactly and it's and it's but it's i mean it's hard not to see and a lot of times you know uh subjects of you know depression and subjects of suicide are, are not enjoyable things for people to talk about and you know and a lot of people are ashamed of feeling depressed they're ashamed of going through you know of going through any kind of dark situation whether it even be with other family members or with your work life or you know all of these things everyone's just kind of scared of of being honest and i guess ultimately i'm always saying it's like it's okay to feel all these ways and to go through all of these things because everyone is going through all of those things all of the time and you know once once we understand that we can literally make take a left turn and sort of a right turn um that's an artistic creative decision that we can make for ourselves yeah and and you know we can we can walk and change our our mindsets in whatever we want in the time we want to and it's, it's what's it's what's beautiful about life is we can literally do pretty much whatever we want to just stepping back one little uh, moment um, about that dichotomy of an audience celebrating songs which might come from a dark place would you agree with some of the greats like Leonard Cohen and others who very often describe this dichotomy um, with something that a lot of them called the joy of the creator. And like, even though those things and those songs and topics come from a dark place, sharing them with other people gives them joy. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's beyond sharing it, it's creating it. It's, it's finding a way to put all these thoughts and feelings into something to share. And then, you know, then being, being able to share it is just an, an extra added joy, in my opinion. You know, that's, it's not necessarily when I'm making a song, I don't necessarily think this is going to be wonderful to play perform live i don't think that 
yeah. in particular. You know, I, I think more. This is this is going to be really exciting to be able to complete the song and mm -hmm. document it and have that be able to be shared with people and other people be able to hear hear this. You know, so I, I do agree with with that statement. And Leonard Cohen, uh, Leonard Cohen has has many uh, many wise ways to put his reasoning for making his music. Um, yeah, you know more more so than than I do because I'm just I'm also learning from him. Yeah, still. Although I still don't know if he would be happy if so many people used "Hallelujah" as a song at their wedding, because. <laughs> That's like the second no, that's... worst. That's the second worst song to play at a wedding. The worst one is "Every Breath You Take." <laughs> Believe agree. me, people. Believe me. Um, but I think something that is also important, and it's also important for me to ask, because we've been talking about dark motifs, dark stuff. Very simple question: Two thousand twenty-three. Are you happy with? where you are in life right now. I'm very happy right now. Yes. Very, very happy. Yes. I couldn't really ask for a better life at this moment of time. That's a wonderful answer. And, and I can go into detail, but the details don't really matter. I don't, I don't details really don't much. matter. Yes. I don't really... Uh... I don't really I don't really need that much, but I'm just, I'm busy. I like being busy. So okay. that's, that's good. Would you say that you're a workaholic or is it just you like to be a busy bee? Uh, well, I'm also really good at not doing anything when I need to not do anything. Okay. Well. <laughs> then you're not a workaholic. I, I, I can stop. That is a good thing. <laughs> um, one last question about the album. Um, the new record is going to be out on Pelagic mid-July. Uh, and as I've already said, folks, uh, I know when you listen to this interview and when you watch it, it's mid-June. So it's still a few weeks till release, but believe me, it's a good one. The record is going to be out on Pelagic. It's uh, a change of label for you. So how yes. did that happen? Um, my working relationship with Sergeant House was kind of getting to a place of uh, stale kind of loss and without going into too many details it's it just kind of a, uh, I think we both had expectations and I kind of was unhappy with the work relationship working relationship with them so Pelagic had done this Lust Mord compilation of a bunch of artists doing their versions of Lust Mord songs, and I contributed to one of those pieces. And just my communications with the label were so uh, kind of casual and easygoing, and and seeing the kinds of records they released, which are beautiful packaging and mm -hmm. it's it's kind of it's a thing that i was missing working with sergeant house is, is being able to do something more elaborate with the packaging because it's such a huge part of the art in my opinion to have you know these really beautiful record packaging it and fun colored vinyl and these things that make you excited to hold these records in your hand Hmm. That's a big. That's a big reason why I have bought certain records in my past, and so working with Pelagic was just somewhat of a natural progression. And you know, the record is not out yet, but so far, so good. I enjoy working with. And it's gonna. Be, it's it's gonna. It's gonna work out very nicely because the music is very good. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you. You have now been part of this whole Louisville scene for decades. Mm -hmm. um, how do you perceive the development of that scene? Um, the development of the scene as far as where it's at now, 
mm-hmm. compared to how it has been. I mean, I would say it's it's very different being a kid and going to punk shows and, you know, being around in the late 90s and going to, you know, see sold out hardcore punk shows. I mean, this was a regular occurrence in the 90s. You know, and also going to see certain shows where I'd see Hoover or certain bands that I'd see them play with 30 people. There were still small shows in the 90s, but I think things got really, really popular in the underground like punk hardcore world here then. And, you know, as Louisville has grown, my brother and I were putting on a lot of underground shows in Louisville for probably probably a decade we were putting on shows here and it just it changes when you get older and you get older and you're kind of like well you know I don't really want to make the same music I made when I was 16 and I you know I don't really want to make the same music I made when I was 20 I don't really want to make the same music I made when I was 25 and then you know, and then I'm yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of more interested in in creating and making music than I am about shows, about you know going to shows and about you know attending shows. And I, I say that, but I still attend lots of shows in town. And the music scene, as far as what is successful, as far as attendance wise, and those kind of things, you know, it's just all. It's also random, and there's a lot of younger bands that are starting right now that are, you know, doing really incredible things. And you know, I, you know, I went to a, I played an all ages show with this new band that I'm doing called Total Concrete, and it's really fast, kind of blistering hardcore. And you know, 15 minutes set, 10 songs in 15 minutes, and were opening for these younger bands and it was such an honor to be there and be with you know kids from it was mostly like kids from the age 12 to you know 18 and just such a different crowd and a, a different energy than anything i am ever around i mean or have been around since i was that age and even even now things are just i feel like the younger generation is just going going to be so powerful and strong in in ways like especially in the underground music world it's it's like i think that we're going to be see so much beauty and powerful things come from young punks i think like it's it's the best it ever has been so it's exciting so could you uh, at from the top from the tip of your tongue could you name like three louisville bands apart from total concrete that you would say okay keep an eye out on those uh there's a band from here called shipfire that's uh i mean they play they play all of the time in louisville but they're they're a really fun band and you know i, I see them I mean, they might play like every other weekend here. I've seen them probably play three or four times and really incredibly tight band and great songs and fun band. And I'm trying to think of some other ones. Uh, you know, I mean, I also love, you know, with, with Louisville, there's a lot more like kind of avant-garde music going on right now also. And, some friends do so? a band called called a uh, equipment appointed onk. You and, you have to send me that name via email because yeah. I sure I will put it in the comment, but I will not be able to understand it. And uh, they're they're a great band. Yeah, Equ- equipment appointed onk is their name. Onk. U N C. A N K H. Okay. So and they're they're kind of more of an improvisational group, you know. Okay. So and, that's two. And, they, and a third 
And on the last shows, that was my brother's show, Photo Crime. Mm. He just played a, a show, you know, just a, just a few blocks from the neighborhood my brother and I both live in. And it was great to see him play. And he has a new album coming out. So that's exciting to go celebrate that with him and, and see his band play. For, for for anybody who's asking, like, photo crime, photo crime, has never heard of it, you have certainly heard of a band called Colosseum. That's where Evans' brother was. Um, Correct. So real, one of those Louisville bands that, that also caught my eye onto the city a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking about older bands, I have to ask that. Is there any chance of getting new music from any of your former bands, be it National Acrobats, Reaver Resist, <laughs> Black Cross slash Black Widows, Young Widows, any chance um, of getting new stuff from any of those? Well, I'm pretty sure it will not be National Acrobat because that no, was I mean, 20 years. Young, Young Widows is actually going to the studio to begin recording a new album this Friday. So Please. this Friday we, we start the recording and, and um, we'll see. Hopefully, fingers crossed, um, an album next year for Young Widows which will be 10 years since our last album. You know that you made an old man happy, right? Um, <laughs> that's very promising. Well, that means very, that. very happy. Um, so that were my usual regular question, but as every listener or people who watch this little ditty regularly know, nobody's can, nobody can escape Veil of Sound interviews without going through the infamous quickfire round at the end. You will get a few questions, which are always like Roses versus Tulips, Amsterdam versus Rotterdam, Gothenburg versus Oslo, you know, and you have to say like, okay, which one do you like more or which one do you prefer at this very moment? And we will start off with something easy. You have been talking about big American cities. So I'll ask you, where would you rather go right now? New York City or LA? New York. Why? Like always give a short um, explanation. Uh, I just kind of like New York better as far as getting around the city. Mm -hmm. It's a little yeah, easier true. than getting around LA. And yeah. um, I mean, once you're in the city, it's easier. I mean, West Coast is, is much more beautiful in my opinion, but you need a car. I'm not, I'm not a I'm not a big LA person. Uh, yeah, it's not really. It's not my town. Yeah, it's a. It has beautiful parts, but I remember driving into LA from the east, and um, I think we crossed LA city limits, and it took us like two and a half hours to get to the beach. Still, and I was like, "What the heck?" That's yeah. just too yeah. big of a city. Um. <laughs> okay. Um. Next question. You have done a lot of noise rock in your time. Uh, and we all know the god of noise rock. Uh, or there are two. I, I always liked Steve Albini a little bit more. So question, which Albini band is more to your liking? Big Black or Shellac? Definitely Shellac. Can um, you say why? Yeah, I really love that Terraform album. And... Um, that uh, that first song, the uh, what's the the, the really repetitive one? Does he that, have any that other song? Kind of song? What's <laughs> you know the one that just kind of goes forever? I can't remember what that's called. But uh, it's the first song on Terraform, and mm -hmm. I kind of uh, I like that that kind of style of repetition, and I connected more with so that album than any of the other Sherlock albums. And yeah, I think they're they're a good band. They're they kind of do a a good twist on all of it, you know, all of the the post punk kind of things, you know. And I was a fan of Big Black, but uh, definitely more of a fan of Schlag. As you've already mentioned, um, post punk, um, Joy Division or Bauhaus. You know, go Bauhaus. Um, kind of like the randomness of, of Bauhaus. 
And I'm not really that. I'm not really a big Jordan Vision fan. You know, it's I, I enjoy it, but it's it's not it's not my division. <laughs> I can understand that. Uh, for me, the problem with Joy Division is always no band can live up to that hype. In retrospect, not even Nirvana. Yeah. Uh, although I mean, that was the hype that I was. My favorite thing about Joy Division is that uh, Ian Curtis supposedly killed himself listening to Iggy Pop the Idiot. Or the single of mass production, and I've always that's one of my favorite Iggy Pop songs and favorite Iggy Pop favorite one of my favorite albums, and I've always thought, and that that would be, I mean that's that's a record I guess if you were to kill yourself that would be a record to listen to. That's what I've always thought, in a good way, in a when positive we're, way. When we're all talking already talking about such dark such dark stuff. Uh, which one do you think is more appropriate to play at a funeral? And I don't know if you know the second one, but it would be my choice. Uh, Iggy Pop's Lust for Life mm -hmm. or The Pogues, Body of an American? Definitely Lust for Life. I'm not a Pogues fan. I can't really get uh, get into the super drunk Shane McGowan okay. singing thing it's uh yeah it's, it's never been a, a thing for me never really i don't think i ever chose chose to put on a folk hmm. song in my entire life so well i'm european we have a different feeling there but um <laughs> when, when we're talking about singers being drunk and that is something that in interestingly came from from one of our writers when I was mentioning that I would be interviewing you, he said like, oh, the guy who sounds, and now comes your choice, Nick Cave or Mark Lanigan? Because he said uh, it's like a cross of both. I would say neither. Okay. But I would say I sound more like Simon Boney, Crime City Solution, than either okay. of them. But which one... <laughs> Do you prefer <laughs> Lanigan or Cave? I would, I would prefer Lanigan. Definitely prefer Lanigan. Do you have a favorite album of this? Bubblegum is my favorite Lanigan album. Bubblegum and Blue Sooner, those two. Mm -hmm. Would be the same for me, but the other way around. Um, yeah. So, last question. Um, as we were talking about hardcore, and as we were talking about New York City, which New York City hardcore band do you prefer? Sig of It All or Agnostic Front? You know, it's, that's another thing. I'm not a big New York hardcore fan. I don't know if I could say I prefer either. That, that's okay. I don't, would, I there don't be, would there be a New York hardcore band that you like? You know, I'd always say it was Bad Brains, but Bad Brains is a DC band. But they're kind of a New York hardcore band also. Yeah, because they recorded a record there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm trying to even think of a New York hardcore band. When I was a kid... I as liked, long as you uh, don't say Biohazard, everything's fine. I'm trying to even think of a popular New York hardcore band. When I was a kid, there was a band from there called Millhouse that I liked a lot. That was, uh, uh, I think the singer went on to do some some other bands, Indecision and something, some other bands. But that was that was probably my favorite New York hardcore band that I can think of. Is there any city in the U.S. where you say, "Okay, I like that hardcore scene"? Uh, I could imagine you being a DC guy. Like, you know, I, I would say, uh, yeah, a DC hardcore would be the only hardcore scene I can think of that I would like. It was a big, it was a big part of the Louisville music scene and influence here. But, you know, at, at a certain point, it's like, I feel like the DC hardcore scene just turned into the, kind of a 
its own thing that wasn't a hardcore sound and you know yeah. i mean like the yeah. end fugazi yeah. is not hardcore it's, it's, it's no, no math rock I, don't know what it, I think i think it's just i think it's fugazi that's true that's true. It still just sounds like fugazi and no one else that is awesome how familiar are you with like hardcore of the last let's say 10 15 years is that still not something very. that you were interested that, in, that much in not very um familiar and i kind of kind of hit uh kind of hit a wall with like the you know with like Bosch stopping playing and Converge Jane Doe you fail me era and that and you know and that was kind of when I I just wasn't really hearing much new after that so I kind of lost interest in discovering new hardcore albums or you know anything in that that world but you know i'm trying to think of other heavy records there's there's a band you know there's just, there's a couple metal records that i've gotten into lately in the past few years that uh or nancy pazuzu what's what's it? Oh, that pazuzu. yeah that's black metal yeah. 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 yeah from finland but yeah, but, yeah. Like that that band is is making really cool records that I'm excited when I hear them. Like they sound like what I kind of loved from you know early, the late '90s and early 2000s hardcore and metal, and they're kind of doing something kind of black you, metal, but it's still very it's very different. Do you like that psychedelic aspect in their music? I do, yeah. I think that's it's not even that psychedelic to me. It's just it's just something different to me. It's just it's it's it just seems like more musical than the kind of straightforward more meat and potatoes kind of metal hardcore world. But but to me I'm just like I don't really need to hear any more of that. I've heard enough. Then before my last question, I hereby give you a listening suggestion. Uh, not only because the guy behind it is a good friend of mine, but also because I think it's a brilliant band that matches this Aranti Pazuzu thing. Um, Ulfa, U L T H A, from Cologne, psychedelic black metal, and maybe the best band ever to come out of Cologne, my hometown. Um, okay. And now, final question, and I uh, I was thinking about which two bluesers to give you because I didn't want to give you any of those that you mentioned. Uh, therefore, I give you the choice between Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Um, no, I, I don't. Muddy Waters is not a favorite. Well, he has, you know, Electric Mud's a good record. Probably my favorite of his, but uh, Robert Johnson just has that, you know, has that dark sound that I like in, in a lot of his songs. Not all of his songs, but you know, and a lot of his his guitar playing is just something very special. You know, it's it's more important to me than most blues guitar players and i feel like his guitar playing influenced so many more than everyone kind of in the guitar world including muddy waters so yeah and also a lot of people uh that then again influenced others i mean like w without without johnson there would not be eric clapton and from clapton yeah a lot of others yeah so to too bad Clapton's an awful person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he hasn't made a good song in, I don't know, how many years? 30? 30, 40, 30. Something like Near that. 40, yeah. Yeah. But closing the cycle to worst songs ever, uh, I don't know if I can stand one more version of Tears in Heaven. Sorry. Bad story, but no, no, thank you. Yeah, 
Evan, thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Absolutely. And everybody, mid of July, Jay Jail, don't let your love life get you down. Listen to it. And if you don't like it, then you have no heart. Evan, your chance for final <laughs> last words. Thank you very much. Thanks for you know taking the time. Thank you for doing this, my friend. Take care. Bye-bye.